Hey there. Recently I was doing some cleaning and was going through a whole bunch of old computer music journal articles. And one of the ones that is my favorite, it's dog-eared many times, is this article by Randy Jones and Ben Neville in a computer music journal article from 2005 called Creating Visual Music in Jitter. And there are a number of things I like about this article. Uh, however, the thing that's really stellar uh, in it and opened my eyes back 10 or 11 years ago when I first read it, uh, is the discussion of the threading model in Max, which happens at the end part of this article. I've included this here at the beginning of our little screencast in case you wanted to follow up with that. One of the unfortunate things is that that article still remains one of the best pieces of information about how threading works in Max. And so I wanted to elucidate a little bit about what's happening with threading in Max. And so I'll talk about the theory of it a little bit first, and then we can talk about some practical applications so that you can optimize your patches so that they perform better. So what do I mean by the threading model? Well, what I mean is that on your computer, you have four cores, for example, or two cores, doesn't matter. We'll say four cores because my computer happens to have four cores in its processor. I'll represent them with these panels. And then the operating system, when it's asked to do some sort of computation, it puts that stuff into one of these cores based on whether that's in something that's called a thread. So if I took another panel, maybe I'll change the color a little bit here and do some, make this one red-ish. You know, we can say that this is a thread and some stuff happens in this thread. And we give this thread to the operating system. And then the operating system says, okay, you go here. And so on your computer, there's a lot of these going on. You know, it's like this one is your finder search. And, and this one is your mail browser. And this one is um, playing a YouTube video. You know, Chrome, it's like every window in Chrome gets its own thread. So like maybe these three our Google Chrome running. And the operating system can put these on any of these cores it wants. And while things are running, it can like even switch them around to try and balance the load on your computer. So in Max, we have a couple of different places where this threading model occurs. And one of those, we just pull all these out of here. Just kind of clear this stuff up. We have a main thread. I'm going to make the main thread be blue. Then we have a scheduler thread. We'll just let the scheduler thread be red. And then we'll have a, a green one. This will be the audio thread. And I'll, I should use some comments here to make this a little bit clearer. OK, so this is going to be our audio thread our main thread and our scheduler thread. Okay, and I'll go ahead, I'm gonna change the color of this blue so that it's a little easier to see. So Max primarily works with these three threads and there could be any number of other threads that are going on, but those threads are gonna be self-contained. So for example, a poly object Inside of it, it might have a bunch of threads, but that stuff isn't getting passed in and out of the outlets of the poly object. That's all just left self-contained within the poly object. Similarly, there are things in Max itself where there might be other threads doing tasks, but those tasks are all self-contained and they aren't going in and out of outlets around your patcher. With these three threads, we can make a little patch and we can understand what's happening. So I'm going to say I have a number and we can send a bang to that number and then we can add these two things together if we have two numbers and out pops another one. And stuff that's just um, simple things like this, this always happens in the main thread. Easy to understand. If we we're processing a jitter matrix, it would 
just pop through there in the main thread. Generally, the main thread is your default. Now, what's going to happen if we wanted some sort of timing sensitive piece of information? Well, the timing sensitive stuff, if it gets bogged down because you're processing jitter matrices, drawing the UI for these um, number boxes, the number box isn't much, but some UI objects do use a lot of CPU, then your timing is going to start getting a little bit sloppy. And so Max introduced this concept called overdrive. If you go to your options, right now I have overdrive checked, which means it's turned on. Another way to access that is in your audio status window. I'll pull that up because we are going to be needing that. What does this mean? Here it's listed as scheduler in overdrive. And what that means is that the scheduler is operating as its own thread. Objects that use the scheduler are those which have some sort of timing mechanism built into them. So what's an example of one that has a timing mechanism built into it? Well, Metro, for example, has a timing mechanism built into it. If I do a, put a toggle on here and a bang here, this, as you could imagine, is a timing sensitive operation. We want the Metro to happen precisely at 100 milliseconds if we said we want it at 100 milliseconds. So there's a timing sensitive operation. Another set of objects that might be considered timing sensitive are any MIDI objects because that's performance data that's coming in. Delay objects, even a delay zero, will be considered a timing sensitive operation. You either want to delay it precisely a thousand. If we say delay zero, what's going to happen is it's going to make something happen as soon as possible, but it's actually going to move it into the scheduler thread. We'll show that in just a second. There's also some that people don't expect. If you think about it, it makes sense, but if we have a line object, for example, we're gonna generate a ramp full of events. This actually uses the scheduler. So if we said line, I'll give it the floating point version so we can generate a floating point ramp. We start at zero, go to one, and say it's gonna happen over 500 milliseconds. And stick a float on the output. All of those little events popping out here, that is all happening in the scheduler. And the scheduler with overdrive on happens in, an, in this scheduler thread instead of in the main thread. If overdrives off, it happens in the main thread. There's one more complication, which is that the scheduler could also actually happen in the audio thread. And that happens if we say uh, scheduler in overdrive and say that it's happening in the audio interrupt. Now it actually happens in the audio thread in between the processing of vectors of audio. And this is the default for Macs for Live devices. So that's important to know. It's a little bit difficult when you're looking at a Max patch and you have all of these options to really understand what's happening. I have made a little object and I'll include it in the link here at the end of this video. And this object is called min.threadcheck. And what the min.threadcheck object is going to do is it will tell us what thread an event occurs on. The, there are three outlets. This outlet is for a message received on the main thread. This one is for one received on the scheduler thread. This is for one received on the audio thread. There is a fourth outlet that says it's received on some other thread. That should never happen in your max patches. And if it is, it's very likely you have some sort of um, third party object that is not behaving as a good citizen because unpredictable things can happen if uh, third party objects don't follow the threading model of Max. Okay, here we go. I'll hook this up. When I click a bang, change a number, we can see that the bangs here all come out of this outlet here. So that means it's happening on the main thread. However, if I 
were to hook a bang up to this delay object, stick this up here, now all of a sudden when I click this, it's been promoted to the scheduler thread. If I were to turn off overdrive, then what we'd see is it happens in the main thread because the scheduler's running in the main thread. Now the scheduler's happening in overdrive. So as we saw earlier with those four columns representing the processors, this would allow the scheduler to run on a different processor that potentially has a lower load than the other processor and you could get better performance out of your computer. Um, but that performance has caveats and for example with um, jitter processing it's often better to run without overdrive. And then we have one more option here. If I turn on audio and turn on scheduler and audio interrupt, now when I do a scheduler event we'll see it's happening in the audio thread. So we turn that off we're back to happening in the scheduler thread. So now what happens if we do something like this? Well, in this case, it gets ambiguous. We have a bang. The bang is going to go from this button to this button in the main thread, from this button to this in the main thread, from here to here in the main thread. Through this patch cord, this is now going to get promoted into the scheduler thread, and then from here to here, here to here, here to here in the scheduler thread. Then this will happen in the scheduler thread because it's happening in the left inlet, and then it will continue on out in the scheduler thread. Because these two threads could be on different processors, or if they're on the same processor, the operating system decides when one stops and the other one um, starts getting serviced again. This stuff could get here before this stuff does, or not. Maybe this will get here before this does. We don't actually know. They could actually both get here simultaneously, um, in which case it's unclear what's going to happen as well. So what you can see is that if you aren't aware of what's happening with your threading, that you that is a source of unpredictability in max patches. So it's helpful to be in control. So as I said, you know, this object here, we could take this and say new send foo. I'll hook this up here. And then we can embed this in a patcher. You receive foo. So we have sends and receives, and there's things happening over here in a some sub patcher. And we don't know what's happening here, but we get this button out here somewhere else in the patch, and it's happening in the scheduler thread. Okay, so I'm gonna paste in a little patcher here. And we're, this is gonna hook up to an Uzi. The Uzi's gonna blast us with these 88,200 um, numbers as fast as it can. And remember, um, you know, if I just click this, all this happens in the main thread, which is fine. Um, it's gonna fill up this buffer here. I need to allocate memory for that buffer. And this is already set to display it in a waveform object, which is a super expensive user interface object. So we're going to go through, we're going to do a trig calculation. We're going to um, write into this buffer one sample at a time, but all in the scheduler thread. And then it's going to need to issue um, some sort of like background update notification thing so that this um, waveform can redraw. You can do that in the main thread and that's great, but if we do something like that, you know, in response to some random thing coming out up here, um, it's going to happen in the scheduler thread. And if we do things like that, it's going to affect 
the timing of the scheduler thread because there's too much computation to perform between ticks of the scheduler thread and your timing will start to get um, poor or lethargic. So if we know we're going to do something like this, there are several ways that we can start to change our patch to be more savvy about what's happening with the scheduling and the threading. So one object that we can use that you might see occasionally is an object called defer. So what defer is going to do, defer will check to see what thread the incoming message is on. And if that thread is not the main thread, then it will send you back to the main thread. So let's see that in action. I'll come over here, I'll click this. And what we're gonna see is that our output from that's going to be in the scheduler thread, but the defer is gonna move it back to the main thread. There you go. That's pretty handy. So defer is one of the uh, weapons in our quiver that's super useful for getting things back to the main thread. Uh, as long as we're filling this out, remember earlier we showed that one way to get things into the scheduler thread, if we needed to do that for some reason, is we can say delay zero. We're going to ignore the audio thread for the rest of this discussion. Okay, there's another object we could use here, and this is called defer low. And what that does is anytime this receives something, it's going to shoot it back to the main thread. I'm gonna put inlet on here so I don't have to keep opening this. Come up here, hit our bang. Okay, so the defer low, every single time it receives input, even if it's already in the main thread, it's gonna put it all the way at the back of the queue. So it'll happen in the main thread still, but it's always gonna get pushed back until after all the other events in the queue are processed. One thing that defer low will do, if you're getting blasted with a whole bunch of different events on the scheduler thread, is it will take each one of those events and put it in the queue to be serviced in the main thread. So that means, let's say you get a whole bunch of updates, you really only care about the last update, it's going to cause all the additional computation of each and every one to occur when the queue does get serviced in the main thread. So there's another object that I use instead of defer low in most situations called QLIM. And by default, QLIM does something that um, real Max geeks would like to say is a usurp. So I'll come here and say usurp. And what that means is that whatever the latest version is that comes in or the latest message that comes in, that's the thing that gets put at the back of the queue. So if you got hit with five notifications of some new thing that came in, then it would only bang once instead of banging five times. That's super useful. And this is my go-to for situations like this. So QLIM, defer, defer low, which I almost never use. These are objects that are super handy. So this, this QLIM in this case, means that if we just get bang, banged away up here, we're just gonna get one bang out and it's gonna do this whole rigmarole once and it's gonna do this back in the main thread and it's not going to make our timing suffer as a result. Another place to be aware of what's happening for the threading is your user interface objects. So for example, we have this going on, and it could be exacerbated um, if we changed the grain time on this. So if I came here and said, I want the grain time on this to be 0 0.1, 
now the line object is going to be blasting out a lot more numbers than it would have been otherwise. So this one little patch, it's not a big deal. And if you had a bunch of these, it might not be a big deal. But if you had, say, 100 of these, and they're all buried inside of abstractions in different places, uh, we have then the potential for this situation to be problematic because this user interface object is going to be run in the scheduler thread. And that's not very fun. And it's going to be happening so fast. Every 0.1 milliseconds, we can't, we can't see that. 30 frames a second would be 33 milliseconds. So there's no point in delivering all of these numbers to the number box. So in this case, we probably don't need a number box if there's hundreds of these buried in sub patches, but maybe, maybe we want that for debugging or something. My solution to that would be to hook up a QLIM before the user interface object. And then whatever was happening down below, let's just say it's one of these, we just hook it up directly and bypass the, the number box instead of having the number box in the chain. I think I'll stop there for today, but hopefully this is gives you a little bit of background information that is hard to find other places and a few techniques and strategies for working on optimizing your patches. Happy patching.